this is Bob Brown with Community Coronavirus Update number 107. We'll talk about the like that we're likely passing the Omicron peak, uh, some lessons from influenza, and a tale of what I would consider three populations. So uh, the good news is case rates uh, seem to be dropping. However, remember the hospitalizations lag about two to three weeks. Our hospitalizations are still at a peak and as high as they've been uh, since a year ago. Uh, so this is still creating a big strain in our on our hospitals yet. Uh, Omaha is kind of in a similar situation. Their hospitalizations are still over 400, and so it's causing a strain for them as well. Uh, however, multiple things are showing that the case rates themselves are dropping. So Lincoln Public Schools, for example, uh, our last complete week was uh, <clears throat> entering January 23rd. We did have about a 300, 400, uh, you know, positive drop in, in, on the combination of staff and students. Uh, we'll see how this uh, week pans out, but things are looking uh, better from a staffing perspective. Uh, UNL, which does uh, some regular tracking as well, is having a big drop in, in positivity rates. Uh, and this also confirmed, I've talked to an infection, uh, urgent care doc I know who says his rates are kind of getting back to now to where they were a month or two ago. So hopefully that uh, means that uh, the future is looking pretty good in the next uh, co the coming weeks to months for our hospitals and, and the community in general. Um, the, the good news, of course, is still that uh, vaccinations, yes, they work. And the, so, yes, there are some people with who've had boosters who are in the hospital, but none of them, and they're in the ICU. And I like the fact that Brian no longer says fully vaccinated because it's not. Two vaccines is not fully vaccinated. Really, it's boosted or up to date would be a better terminology. Uh, but again, this is confirming that it's not necessarily Omicron that's milder. It's just that if you've been vaccinated, your immunity makes Omicron milder. And so I think this is probably one of our two biggest misconceptions right now that has often gotten wrong in the press. Omicron as a virus has not evolved to be milder. We have more immunity now, and that's why it's milder. So Omicron didn't respond to some selection pressure to become milder. Uh, the other misconception, again, two shots is not fully vaccinated. Uh, you should be up to date with three bo with your booster. Uh, and again, I think this confirms that yes, boosters do work. Uh, two shots is pretty good. I mean, almost very few of the people who've had two shots are in, in the ICU, but none of the ones, uh, for example, here in Bryan are boosted in, in the ICU. Uh, this slide, uh, I got this from uh, Caitlin Gentilina's recent update, and I'll put a link in, uh, hit it in just a second, but that's also in the notes section. Uh, basically, what, po again, pointing out COVID has grown gradually less lethal over the pandemic, mainly due to immunity. Uh, but it's still more dangerous than flu. But you know, when we started off, the co the COVID mortality was 20 times what it was with influenza. And initially, a lot of people were confusing case fatality and infection fatality. So a lot of the amateur epidemiologists miss that. Uh, but infection fatality rate is about 20 times uh, for the for the strains before we started getting vaccinations and better immunity. And so what's causing this drop is the vaccinations uh, is the main th factor. Notice this is for England. If you were, did the same thing for the United States, this number wouldn't have dropped as much because we haven't boosted as much as England in Ireland. Uh, so for example, I talked to my daughter who lives in Dublin on Sunday and, and Ireland is past their peak. They never did hit hospital capacity. They're pretty much going to be returning to normal in the coming weeks. But again, they did a much better job of getting their population boosted like United Kingdom and Italy, for example, whereas the United States were down here hanging out with Brazil, Thailand, and Iran as far as our booster vaccinations. And so for us, that, that, uh, that data wouldn't look the same because we haven't boosted people. So although we hope we're going to follow the UK and Ireland pattern and return have a steep drop. We'll probably have a drop. The question is how much, though. Uh, so uh, if you want to read some good summaries, I think Caitlin Gentilini has done some great work lately with their current state affairs, predicting the next booster and talking about how uh, this uh, next variants uh, seem to be evolving and, and, and uh, uh, changing over time. There's some lessons we can learn about from influenza and how, how uh, variations change or variants change over time. Time, but it hasn't really settled in a pattern quite yet, which and this is a very good uh, uh, summary of, of that. Um, so the question in, in everybody's mind really is, yes, we're probably going to get a steep drop. The question is, will we get a steep drop like last winter, where we dropped pretty much down to normal by spring and summer? Or will it be like Delta, where we got a drop, but unfortunately it's kept uh, you know smoldering for months at a time, and then the Omicron variant came in. So which of these two patterns are we going to follow is the big question right now. If we only follow this, the problem, and, and we decide that this is, quote, the new normal, that is about a thousand deaths a, 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 a day. That means that COVID could stay one of the top three causes of death in the United States, along with cancer and heart disease, for the time being. However, there's going to be that's going to be for some people, but not other people, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We hope we'll go back down to here, but we don't know for sure we're going to drop down. We could end up dropping to only this level, unfortunately, and we'll only time's going to tell. Uh, if you want a really, really in-depth summary, that's very good. Uh, Dr. Greg Pullen from the Mayo Clinic did this really good summary about you know going through the history all the way back to the flu pandemic of 1918 and how things changed then and kind of using some projections there. And I think it's really worth your while. So if you want a good in-depth uh, podcast or the YouTube video, I'd really encourage you to this. And 
again it's in the loop, uh, the, the notes section or you can probably just google it as well uh, one of the things he points out that you know the big mis misconception is that some, that natural immunity is somehow better than vaccination. That's actually the other way around. Uh, the reason we have vaccines, or one of the reasons, is vaccines that give you a much more predictable immune response. And what we're finding is that yes, natural infection gives you some immunity, but not near as much as vaccination does. Not as predictable, nor as durable. And so yes, getting a coronavirus infection can give you help some uh, in fact, protection against a future one, but not enough to keep you out of the hospital frequently. Um, so basically he talks about, you know, basically the first booster, the second Moderna, for example, that I got, we saw some waning over time, got our third one. We'll see how long the third one lasts you as far as protection. And we may end up having, having a variance in the future. And one thing you pointed out is that, you know, all of us are still influenza. We are getting variants of the influenza pandemic of 1918, 19. That is what we're vaccinating against to, to, to this day. Uh, and so, uh, this is likely to become a part of our life in the future, just like we have flu pandemics every year. His prediction is your great grandchildren will be getting COVID vaccines just like they get flu vaccines today, or most people anyway, or at least the ones that will keep mortality down to a dull roar. Um, so if you look through history, you know, uh, back in uh, back in the, the 1819 flu pandemic, we got this massive drop in life expectancy. That wasn't World War One. World War One is this small drop here. When all the troops came home, they spread it all around the world, all this troop transport basically, and that's what spread this around and brought it back and back and forth around the world. Uh, this is where this pandemic, uh, the life expectancy drop of 10, 10 to 15 years happened. We would have had the same thing from COVID, but we have something that we didn't have back then. Uh, we had vaccines. We have modern medical care, oxygen tanks, ICUs. This is what kept our mortality from being in this range. However, if you look at our, our drop in life expectancy right now, just in the first year, it's actually caused almost as much of a drop as World War II did. And by, by the time we get the, the, the rest of these this wave surge in, I think you'll see a bigger life expectancy drop from coronavirus than we had for World War II. Not as bad as the flu, but that's because we have modern medical care and vaccines. But this is kind of what the what we have to use as our context for thinking about what's the future going to look like uh, getting past COVID. So I think we have a tale of three populations. It's not going to be the same for all of us because all of us are doing different things. So I think you have a tale, you'll, you'll have a pathway for the un and under vaccinated. You'll have a path, pathway for the up-to-date vaccinated and the immunocompromised. So the un and under vaccinated, well, unfortunately, they're just going to have a higher hospitalization and death rate, which we just keep seeing repeated over and over again with everybody's data. This is Nebraska-specific data on Nebraska-specific patients in Nebraska-specific hospitals, showing that all these people who did not get vaccinated are dying and are going to the hospital at a much higher rate. And most of these people actually had COVID at least once, probably this either this surge or the last winter surge. So this is a lot of these people, this is their second infection, actually. Uh, whereas those who got either two shots or three are having a much lower mortality rate. So the un and under vaccinated COVID could remain one of the top three causes of death for the near future and maybe for indefinitely. Uh, because basically the natural infection just doesn't give you the same durability of infections as getting two, uh, the three shots does. Uh, the up-to-date vaccinated, I think for us, COVID's about the same as influenza at this point. So once this surge is passed, I'll probably return to life uh, to normal the way I acted pre, pre-COVID, actually, unless we get a new variant coming down the pike. Uh, some changes that I might continue, though, for example, I may continue to wear a mask on in international flights, for example, uh, by doing th some of the things like masking international flights that is one of the things that seems to have helped keep make influenza a thing in the past we have two years now of no influenza pandemic so we can control these things we've, we've cut with vaccinations we've kept influenza down to about 30,000 deaths a year in the United States uh, if we could do the same for COVID we could get get COVID down to 30,000 deaths instead of the 300 to 400 we're gonna we've been seeing lately and so this uh, mortality curve if you have your two shots and, a, and your booster, your mortality is uh, risk is uh, approaching that of a typical flu year, whereas the rest of the population is not. The big problem, I think, is for the immunocompromised. They're going to have to uh, be a little higher uh, uh, or a little more careful. Uh, they've got things they can do, though. So we've got better masks that they could use, for example, that'll help protect them there when they're in high-risk situations. There's Evyshield, which is an antibody infusion you can get that could last for six months, for example, that might also help protect you in case your immune own immune system can't make a good response to the vaccine. And you've got Paxlovid, so Trivimad and Rebdesivir. We got these treatments, some of them now, which are pills and even outpatient. And so this is another tre uh, option for you to help keep your mortality down to the rest of us, like the up-to-date vaccinated folks. Uh, and so that'll, I think, we'll, we'll see. Will we, will, we, will we return to this level or will we return to this level? And I think it's going to be dependent on vaccination rates and whether we put in any public health responses in Nebraska. And so I think we have some Nebraska policy decisions to make. I and mean, one thing that people keep forgetting is the CDC and the, the federal government has very little they can do to control the pandemic because public health is enacted at the local and state level. 
if the state of Nebraska is going to decide that they don't like public health responses and we're not going to do any state vaccine requirements, we're not going to do any state mask ordinances, then I think we have to plan for what that means. And that means you're going to have to develop a larger healthcare workforce because we're having a hard time keeping healthcare workers keeping up with this. I think you're going to have to look at things like state run ambulance services because a lot of rural areas, those ambulance services are volunteer and they're burning out the people driving ambulances. And so one of the problems right now is transferring people when they get sick. So the state, if the state has decided, meaning our governor and our chief medical are not going to put in a public health response, they're going to have to plan for this because it's their job and they've got the money, the stimulus money to plan for this, but it's going to take them a while to build this. Uh, there's an opinion piece by Dr. Lena Wen that I read yesterday. I thought this was pretty good, actually. Um, yes, more variants may emerge in the future. That's why we should lift restrictions now. That applies if you're doing, uh, if there's better vaccination. And so you, there's a little clarification there. You have to read the subject, the substance of our article to say that uh, as long as we're tying opening to vaccination rates, then we can, yeah, return to normal. But without that proof of vaccination, uh, we're going to potentially have very high death rates in the future. Uh, so I actually do think in the next few weeks we'll be uh, tar reversing the mask ordinances even at Lincoln and Omaha. However, I think we have to have a plan to put them back in place. And I think she's talking about, you know, we can't do this forever. People need a break. And I think there's a good chance we're going to have that. Um, but, you know, keep in mind, though, we have to be ready. New variants aren't destined to be milder. They could, the next one could actually be worse. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 had a mortality of 14 to 15 percent, not 0.5 or 1. Uh, and so that could happen, and we have to be ready for it next time. Uh, and so that's the strategies. We need to have that baseline immunity through vaccinations. Hopefully we can do a better job of getting more people that third shot, for example, and more of our kids vaccinated. Uh, one of the problems people keep forgetting is that the, the, the hospitalizations for children actually lab two to six weeks. The multi-inflammatory system uh, uh, syndrome that kids get is going to show up weeks later, and that's what's happening at Children's Hospital right now. They're at capacity there in, uh, on the 20s uh, as far as people, kids hospitalized for COVID right now, and they're offloading to Bryan Hospital uh, because of the capacity issues, and that may continue to rise for a while because that lags even more than adult hospitalizations. Uh, we may have to have occasional masking in the future tied to disease monitoring. So one of the things we need to do is have better uh, state and local dashboards to monitor this and be proactive next time. So we put on our masks ahead of time to prevent this surge. Hopefully we won't need to, though, if we got enough vaccinations. We also need to improve our testing and outpatient treatment. So right now there's not a really organized system where really it's very confusing for people who, who do want to get and need to get treated. Can they get tested rapidly, get in quickly to get remdesivir or sotruvimab or Paxlovid? And, and what are the insurance coverages? So one of the problems with remdesivir is, yes, it's potentially available, uh, but it, what is your insurance cover? And could this cost you a couple thousand dollars to get it? In long term, I think we got to think about better ventilation, just like, you know, for example, on international flights, uh, uh, because of the what, we're, what we've learned, I may continue to wear a decent mask on an international flight, for example. Uh, but if we want to prevent uh, things, uh, another way to prevent spread is to have better ventilation systems in our hot, in our in our restaurants, in our schools, things like that. Find ways we can either get more air changes or step up to a MERV 13 air filter. Uh, hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, I do think, I guess I do have, do, I am cautiously optimistic of the future. Again, disclaimer, uh, these are my opinions, not necessarily those of, the, of who I work with and for here, but this is what I do for a living if you want to check that out.